Okay, welcome to uh, Child Psychology, Psych 235. Today we're talking about middle childhood biosocial development. Um, we are not going to finish it today, we're only going to cover half of this. So let's get started. We're going to talk about all these things physical growth. We're going to talk about the fact that, that uh, this period of time for children is a healthy time. We'll talk about obesity, which is getting to be more of a problem and actually uh, not a sign of, uh, of health, right? Uh, and about health in general, um, asthma, some things like that. And then the rest um, we'll get to uh, next week. Okay, so let's get into this. <clears throat> So we're talking about, so we're in the next uh, period here of, uh, of development, what is called uh, early childhood ages, um, no, no, middle childhood, middle childhood, ages six to 11, okay? So no longer in that two to six uh, period of development, now we're talking about ages six to 11, okay? Uh, during this time, physical growth slows temporarily. So children don't grow as fast during this time. They were growing much faster before from ages two to six. Uh, but they still gain about five and uh, five to seven pounds per year and about two inches per year. It's still technically fast, just not as fast as before. They become slimmer as they get taller, their limbs lengthen. Okay, yeah, they look longer. Their legs uh, get longer, their arms get longer. Uh, and if you have a normal, healthy child, they look kind of slim. They uh, no longer look like, uh, like babies or toddlers that look kind of pudgy. You know, they don't look that way anymore. They look slimmer now, okay? Their muscles also become stronger. <clears throat> a 10-year-old, for instance, can throw uh, two times farther than a six-year-old, okay? Lung capacity expands, right? Uh, their lungs can take in more oxygen, right? So that allows them to run faster, to exercise longer, okay? Uh, little kids uh, are basically easily winded. You know, they, uh, they can't last that long if you take them on a hike or on a walk or something like that. Uh, but children during this time are able to take longer walks with you because their lung capacity expands. Uh, there's also more skill in controlling the body. Okay, better at, at movement, better at catching and playing sports, all sorts of things. Okay, let's keep going. Um, now, physical activity uh, is, uh, is of course always important and uh, it, it's very important during this time as well, okay? It's important that kids basically uh, get to run around and play and be active, okay? So physical activity and play contributes to health in many ways, okay? It helps them stay healthy for them to be running around and playing. So they have better overall health if they get to play and run around and catch things and play sports, all those things, right? They have less obesity, Right, if they actually are actually physically playing, um, they uh, gain an appreciation of cooperation and fair play. Right, they learn how to cooperate as they play games, as they play sports. They learn about fair play and following rules. Right, they also learn. Um, it also helps them uh, uh, improve their problem-solving ability when they play. Right, when they play sports, you know, they think of strategies. Uh, they think of ways to solve problems if they're behind or how to keep the lead or things like that. Or even in, uh, with other games where, you know, it may not be sports, but they're just playing with each other. They're trying to solve problems like how to build something, you know, <clears throat> uh, how to create something, okay? So they have to think, okay? They also learn respect for teammates and opponents um, of many ethnicities and nationalities when they play, you know? Though, you know, there's, uh, there's diversity. We live in a very diverse country, right? And they'll learn how to respect people who are different than themselves, right? How to get along with others. <clears throat> and this is all good for them. It's good for them to play. And you should encourage them to play. And, uh, and you know, and, and not, uh, not, and not, basically don't encourage them to exclude people who are different, okay? Uh, this is how kids make friends is basically by uh, a lot is of it is through playing. Okay. And you need to encourage them to play with whoever's willing to play. You shouldn't exclude someone just because they're different because they also learn to respect others who are different than themselves. Um, their opponents are technically someone who's different who's on the other side of the team. 
that person may or may not be like them, but they need to, uh, <clears throat> they need to play fairly. They need to learn about fairness. They need to, uh, you know, to learn to cooperate. And this is all important. These are all things they can learn through play and not just through us telling them. Uh, <clears throat> so um, this, uh, these graphs over here uh, tell you that middle childhood is a pretty healthy time, okay? Ages six to 11 is the healthiest period of time in, of the entire lifespan. Okay, um, and let me show you the, let me show you why. Let, let's point out these graphs here. Let's look at the one on the bottom first. The one on the bottom does, I mean, tells you something, uh, but not so much about this period of time, but I, but I wanna point it out because it says something overall. So if you look at the graph at the bottom, number of deaths per 1,000. So think of it as, you know, just the number of people dying. And you can see when you're very young, you're not very likely to die. And then <clears throat> you get older, stays pretty low. And as you get older into your 50s, 60s, 70s, it rises dramatically, okay? You're more likely to die when you're old, okay? You have a limited lifespan and when you're older, you're more likely to die, okay? <clears throat> it rises rapidly, um, you know, once you, you hit like your 50s, 60s, okay? So you're not very likely to die when you're young. But if we look at a graph that looks at a shorter period of time, and that's the one on the top, that looks basically at ages like one to like 19, you can see that this period of time is actually the time in which children are the least likely to die. So you can see when they're about one year of age, um, you know, uh, number of deaths per 1,000, right? Uh, they're a little bit more likely to die, and then it goes down a little bit as they get a little bit older, it stays uh, steady. And then at about six, seven years of age, there's a little dip there, up to about 11, <clears throat> 12, and then after that it rises significantly. So you can see this period of time is a very healthy time, okay? Uh, <clears throat> for many reasons, okay? Uh, during this time, children are, uh, are just more capable. They're less likely to drown in a pool. They're less likely to, to uh, basically put something poisonous in their mouth. Uh, they're more likely to be able to take care of themselves a little bit more. You should still watch them when they play, but they're just a lot less likely to die, okay? Not a lot less likely. They're a little bit less likely to die, okay? But you should still be watching them. Uh, I should also point out this is a, a, a very good time to travel if you have uh, children. You know, they're not uh, so young that they're extremely difficult, and they're not teenagers yet, and teenagers can be very difficult as well. So this is a very good time in which they're better able to take care of themselves. They're more cooperative. Uh, they're more capable so they can walk with you, play with you, right? You can go somewhere with them and have more fun. Um, <clears throat> but you should still be watching them. Okay. Um, let's keep going. Um, it's a healthier time for many reasons. Okay. Uh, one of those reasons is that, you know, immunizations have reduced, reduced deaths dramatically. A lot of children used to die, you know, from... Um, from a, a lot of diseases, okay? Uh, you know, uh, hundreds of years ago or decades ago, whenever the, the vaccines were, uh, uh, were developed, okay? <clears throat> a lot less children, or it's actually rare that children die now from uh, some of these diseases that just ravaged uh, ch uh, children's health uh, <clears throat> decades ago or a hundred years ago, okay? Things have changed because of those immunizations. I know we have the anti-vaxxers there and I'm gonna keep pointing this out Okay, those people are wrong. Okay, they're going against science, they're going against medical fact. Okay, the science is very clear. Um, <clears throat> serious accidents, fatal diseases, minor diseases are less common during this time. Serious accidents, like I said, children are less likely to drown. Okay, uh, if they fall into a pool, well, they're not going to really fall into a pool during this time unless somebody pushes them. Okay, but if they do, you know, fall into the pool or somebody pushes them into the, into the pool, uh, they're more likely to survive. They're more likely to be able to thrash around and get themselves to the edge and pull themselves out. Whereas before this, when they were ages two to six, they're more likely to drown if they haven't been taught how to swim. Uh, by this time, they're more likely to know how to swim. And even if they don't, um, you know, they're more likely to survive, okay? They're not just gonna drown like right away. Uh, before this, you know, when you, especially when you have like a two-year-old or something like that, they fall into the pool, um, you know, five minutes and they could be basically drowned already, you know, even less than that. Uh, <clears throat> fatal diseases, less common, like I said, uh, for many reasons, immunizations and uh, 
better health care and things like that. Minor diseases are less common, less exposure to environmental toxins, right? By this time, they know about secondhand smoke and they know that's bad and they can, um, you know, get away from it, right? Hearing problems, amnesia, other things have been diagnosed and treated earlier. Hearing problems, of course, you know, you know if, they, if they have problems hearing, you know, that could indicate that. That might be a reason why they may not be doing well in school because they can't hear. That can be corrected, right? Anemia, uh, which is, uh, <clears throat> but when they're anemic, it basically they have weaknesses, you know, they feel weak, they feel tired very easily. Um, that can be diagnosed and, uh, and treated. It usually has to do with a lack of iron in the blood. <clears throat> Even oral care has improved, right? Um, you know, nowadays children are more likely to go to the dentist, get their teeth checked out, make sure they, you know, and uh, more likely to, uh, you know, to brush properly. Toothpaste has improved all those things, right? <clears throat> when I was a kid, we were poor. I think I remember going to the dentist maybe about two times. That was pretty much it, okay? And every time I went, they just pulled out teeth. That's what I remember. Uh, <clears throat> things are a little bit different now, okay? Um, you know, um, there's better care and, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, you're more likely to go to that to you know to the to the dentist okay i believe more people have health care now for obvious reasons and of course some people are trying to take that away and that's not a good thing okay uh, <clears throat> uh neighborhood play um speaking of play play is actually very important um and a lot of children of course will play in their in their neighborhood okay uh, around you know where the other homes right there with other kids who live near them even in their own backyards, um, places like that. When I remember when I was a kid, yeah, we played in our own yard. We also played out in the street, okay? Because we didn't have big yards, so we played in the street and we would have races in the street and we'd even put a little basketball court out there and we'd play basketball out there. We'd play baseball out there in the street because, you know, we didn't have this huge yard or anything like that. But we played in that neighborhood and this is what kids do, okay? Hopefully the neighborhood is safe. Ours wasn't that safe, but we always have people looking out and make sure that we didn't get hit by a car. Um, but other neighborhoods are even safer, <clears throat> especially if you live in a cul-de-sac or something like that, okay, at that part of the neighborhood where, you know, there's a dead end, so cars don't really go in there that much unless they live there. Uh, <clears throat> so the rules and boundaries are contextually adapted when you, you know, when you have this type of neighborhood play, right? What that means is that uh, the rules about how you're going to play, where the boundaries are, right? If, like, if you're playing, uh, you know, uh, baseball, which, you know, what's, what's the, what, you know, how far can you go before you're out of the baseline or something like that or uh you know or you're out of bounds right uh if you're playing basketball right um it depends on what you have around me or if you're playing soccer or something like that you're gonna say all right this is the goal post right here it's between these two trees if you get the ball through there that means you score a goal if i go somewhere else then that's not a goal okay so we use things like that uh that car over there that's that's first base uh, that van, that's second base. And I remember playing like that. And this is what children do. They make up rules according to what they have around them. Okay. <clears throat> play is more likely to be active, right? Uh, you know, children running around and playing interactive, right? They interact with other kids and inclusive. They'll play tag, hide and seek, basketball, baseball with whatever they, you know, they have, you know, and I remember actually even playing um, baseball, we didn't have a bat, okay, a real bat or a catcher's glove or anything like that. We were poor. We would use our hands to catch the ball and we didn't have a real ball. Uh, we would use a tennis ball. Why would we use a tennis ball? Because we actually found those lying around. You know, for some reason, there were tennis, ball, tennis balls that we would find and we would use those and a stick as a bat, right? But yeah, we played tag as well, hide and seek and things like that, right? But so we're running around, we're playing, we're interacting with each other. We're including each other, right? Uh, you know, even my sister played, right? Even though most of us were boys, but you know, we included each other, and you know, <clears throat> and we played with our neighbors. That's that's the way play kind of is. Um, modern life has been contributing to a reduction of neighborhood play. <clears throat> There's been a little bit less of this because of all this increasing development that is limiting actually open space. <clears throat> a lot of homes being built, especially in uh, uh, or a lot of uh, high rises, especially in places that are very dense. Um, and there's not as much open space as there once was. And children use whatever open space they can find to play. And because there is an open space, you know, children will sometimes just play in the street, 
right? Whatever open space they can, they can find. So, but uh, this rampant development has been reducing neighborhood play by taking away space. If you live, of course, in a rural part of town where there's open fields and hills and things like that, kind of like where we're at over here, it's not so much rural, but uh, it's, uh, it's less dense, right? Um, then you have more places where you can play, at least uh, wilderness and things like that. You might have to drive a little bit to go to those hills right there, to go there around where the aqueduct is. Um, <clears throat> and of course, watch your kids, it could be dangerous. There's no swings or stuff like that, but you can go on hikes and you can go exploring and things like that. And I take my kids sometimes like that. And there's also parks and things like that. But the more dense, right? If you live in a big city or something like that or in a very dense development, there's gonna be less open space. Okay, and that means less space for children to play and interact, okay? Um, less trees for them to climb if there's trees like that. Now, they shouldn't always be climbing trees. Some of them are dangerous, but if there's trees that are kind of easy to climb, you know, like these little girls over here, then they can do that. <clears throat> Social exclusion is uh, very destructive, very hurtful, okay? When children uh, exclude each other, right? It's hurtful. It shows a lack of cooperation, right? When children are excluded, when children basically are told, no, you can't play with us, you are too little, right? You know, or you're a girl, you shouldn't play with us. Um, or for whatever reason, you know, you're, you know, kids can also be excluded. Uh, you know, they shouldn't be taught this and they should be corrected. Kids can exclude each other based on how they look because some kid is funny looking or happens to be uh, darker in skin color or different race or things. The kids don't even know about race at, at this point so much but they do notice differences and they can exclude each other for things like that. And you need to correct them. They shouldn't exclude each other for things like that. It's very hurtful, especially for those people who are, those kids that are excluded. And uh, <clears throat> it does happen and you need to correct them. You need to teach them that they need to include everyone when they play, find a way to play with everyone. <clears throat> um, this leads us to exercise, of course. Exercise is very important and children get uh, you know, a lot of exercise if they should play, if they play outside and they run around and things like that, right? Um, but they also get exercise in school. It's important that they get exercise in school. It's important that they get this physical activity um, in school, right? Physical education, recess, they even get to play during lunch if there's enough time, right? All of that is important. Physical education and no recess are sometimes uh, nowadays being replaced with reading and math. There's been this emphasis lately uh, that children need to learn how to read and do math. They need to learn science, right? Because we're not doing so well in those areas. Uh, and they're placing a lot of emphasis on that. Uh, <clears throat> and what some schools are doing is they're shortening recess time, right? Taking away time from recess, taking away time from physical education, uh, reducing lunch time, basically. So children only have time to eat and not really play. And that's actually really bad, okay? Children need exercise. They need to run around and play. It helps them socialize and make friends. But not only that, it also helps them learn even those other subjects because when children do those things and they get to be with their friends, they get to play and they, then they go back to the classroom, they are more ready to learn, okay? Because they are more relaxed, okay? Um, they've had a break from those things, right? From reading and math and science and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> and research shows that they're actually uh, more eager and ready to learn if you give them a chance to play. Reducing play is actually harmful for their learning, okay? Uh, APA, American Psychological Association, recommends, uh, suggests basically that, uh, uh, that recess is a crucial component of child development and you should not be reducing that, right? And you should not be getting rid of that. In some places, uh, they are. Uh, right now, when we're doing remote learning, uh, it seems that, um, that they're really not focusing on that very much. Uh, we're, you know, they're trying to incorporate PE now and stuff like that and, you know, watch a video and have them, you know, do some little movements or dances or things like that, which is good. Uh, but I've noticed, um, I don't know how long recess is in my child's school, but um, I suppose it's got to be longer than 20 minutes or maybe that's how long it is. But when they do have a break and they have recess, okay, um, they get like 20 minutes. And by the time the teacher basically, you know, like, uh, you know, stops the lesson and we get up, we put on our shoes, we go outside, right? It's like, there's like, uh, you know, 15 minutes left, sometimes like 10 minutes left. And then we got to come back a few minutes early. So you only really get like 10 minutes to play. And that's not enough, okay? They should get half an hour for recess, okay? And then they also, they should get about an hour for lunch, right? For them, for them to have time to eat and also play. 
But in some places, it's gotten, so, it's gotten so bad, they get so little time for lunch because they don't want children to play. They just want them to do more learning, right, uh, inside the classroom, that they've made lunch so, um, so short, shorten the time so much that children actually don't even have enough time to eat, which is awful. Because remember, when you do go to lunchtime, right, uh, you have, I remember you line up, right, and, and, and certain kids get to eat before others. And, you know, there's a bunch of kids, they, you know, they can't all eat at the same time. So there's, a, there's lines and there's a little bit of waiting. And it turns out that some kids don't even have enough time to finish their meals because they've shortened lunchtime so much. Where in the past, remember when I was in grade school, they gave us like a whole hour, right? Time to eat and time to play. That's important, okay? Eliminating recess may actually, uh, and, and another time to play like during lunchtime may actually reduce mastery of reading and math, okay? Children need to do different things. They need variety in their school day. Otherwise it gets boring, it gets dull and motivation suffers and so does learning. Um, <clears throat> let's talk more about health. Now, th there are problems with uh, child obesity that are increasing. We'll talk about that. How do you know if your child is obese, right? Well, there's something known as body mass index that you need to be aware about, okay? BMI is a person's body weight. Okay, there's many ways to calculate BMI, but here's one way to think about BMI. It's a person's body weight, right, in kilograms, divided by the square of their height in meters. Okay, so that's any, that refers to an equation. If you wanna figure out your BMI, <clears throat> you know, first I would start with, um, uh, you know, with your, uh, your body weight, right? I know we use pounds here, right, in the US. So um, convert that to, gil to kilograms, right? Take your weight in pounds, you know, and divide it by 2.2. That's how many, there's 2.2 kilograms uh, per pound, okay? So you have your weight in kilograms, and then you have to um, divide that by your height in meters. So you have to turn your height, which you know in inch inches, right? Like 60 inches is five feet. You have to turn that into meters, and then square that number, right? Multiply times itself, okay? And then take your weight in kilograms divided by that number. You'll get some, so, you know, some, uh, <clears throat> some fraction or some ratio, right? Or some, some number, which basically indicates your BMI. If it's 0.25, it means you're overweight. If it's 0.30 or more, it means you're obese, right? If it's less than 0.25, um, it's like between 0.25 and like uh, 0.19, that means you're normal. If you're less than 0.19, that means you're too skinny, okay? Or anorexic, if you should happen to be older and a teenager, stuff like that. Uh, that isn't the way it's used. Uh, it's calculated for children, though. Uh, for children, they look at percentages. Uh, for children, um, you know, uh, like, you know your child is overweight if they have a BMI above the 85th percentile. So you're, basically what happens is your doctor, the, the doctor will weigh the child. And they have a graph that tells them more or less how much kids weigh, right? And they look at where your kid falls on the, in the graph. And <clears throat> if they are in the 85th percentile or more, that means that 85, that they are, they weigh more than about 85% of children, okay? That means they're overweight. If they're in the 90th percentile, that means they weigh more than 90% of children. Okay, so they're, if they're 85th percentile or above, that means they're overweight. If they're 95th percentile or above, that means your kid is obese. Okay, and obesity is particularly problematic. Okay, because we're having, we have kids nowadays, this used to be unheard of, but we do have kids that are obese. And um, even children uh, that are obese can have health problems. Okay, it used to be unheard of that children could have things uh, basically like uh, <clears throat> Uh, for instance, like diabetes. Now we have childhood diabetes, and we're not talking about type one, it's type two, which is related to obesity, right? Those things used to be unheard of in children. We only used to see that in adults. Now we see it in children as well, okay? And it's becoming a problem. It affects children's health, and uh, it leads to shortened lifespans over time, okay? Speaking a little bit more about obesity, um, so things have been changing, okay? Not all kids are healthy during this time. Six to 11 uh, years old, right? These are the statistics for, for children. And they can change a little bit from year to year. But the trend is not good. It's been getting worse and not better when it comes to obesity. About 32%, almost one in every three children now is overweight, okay? And about 18% are obese in the US of children, six to 11 years of age. The picture of that kid you see there, that is not, well, that is an overweight kid, but that kid is not just overweight, that kid is obese. And not just slightly obese either, right? Extremely obese. Obese enough that that kid 
probably has health problems, okay? Not a good thing, okay? And it's been getting worse over the years. When I was a kid, obesity was rare. You might have one or two, you know, chubby kids in the class, that's about it. Now you look at the classroom and these six to 11 years old, the six to 11 years old, and you'll see like a third of them basically are chubby, are overweight or obese. It's like, it's, it's unacceptable, right? Why is this happening and why should we care, right? Well, obesity increases the risk of diabetes, and now we're seeing diabetes in kids, right? Increases the, the risk of strokes. Believe it or not, even children are getting strokes nowadays, right? Heart disease, cancer, right? All that can affect even children. It's less likely to affect you when you're young, but it's happening in children as well, and that is inexcusable. That used to be unheard of, right? Children are supposed to be young and healthy. They're not supposed to have diabetes, be getting strokes, getting heart disease and cancer, right? But that's happening. And as you get older, the chance of having that, of developing that increases if you're obese. It's particular, it's more problematic when you're older, but it can start relatively young and you can be unhealthy even when you're young. And that's really bad, okay? You don't, that's just uh, inexcusable that we have these problems. School achievement, self-esteem decreases. These kids, they know they're overweight. Uh, the ones who are especially obese, they know they're obese. They get picked on, right? They feel worse about themselves. And often, uh, because of that, their school achievement can suffer. They may not work as hard, try as hard. They don't feel good about themselves. Their motivation can suffer. Loneliness is common. They're often left out, not picked to be on the team, or, uh, you know, or less likely to have friends, um, you know, because they get picked on. Their self-esteem suffers, and then they, uh, you know, they have uh, more trouble relating to other kids. But there's a lot of them now. There's not just one or two obese kids in the class. Now, now there's a whole group of them. So I guess they have more company, but it's, it's a bad trend that we're seeing. Why does childhood obesity even exist? Well, research has pointed to one thing is heredity. Okay, so biology is always, a, uh, is, is always an issue, okay? Uh, it's always something that's involved in development. Um, some children are genetically more predisposed to be obese than others. Yes, yeah, some children gain weight more easily. Some children can become obese uh, more easily. Um, that's just the way it is. Um, you know, it's um, genetically, it's, it's uh, obesity, it's, it's a bit more common. It's especially, uh, not common, but um, I'll put it to you this way. Um, those that are of uh, 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 Native American are a bit more ge genetically predisposed to become obese. Um, if you think about Native Americans and their culture, their heritage, their, their history, right? Uh, it, was, it, it was very different, okay? Actually, very different for all of us, but especially for them, right, where you have a culture that, you know, basically relied on the land for survival and, you know, basically uh, lived sustainably and stuff like that. And they were able to survive even when food was scarce, right? So they're kind of genetically uh, programmed to some extent to be able to survive with not a lot of food, okay? And now we have a society where there's plenty, right? A uh, society of plenty. We have supermarkets, we have fast food, we have all these things. Uh, and, uh, you know, and just some are more likely to become obese than others because of that, because of genetic predispositions, okay? Uh, <clears throat> parenting also matters. Infants that are not breastfed are more likely to be obese later on, right? Uh, drinking, I mean, watching too much TV, right? Sitting on your butt watching TV rather than playing and exercising, right? Drinking soda, not getting exercise, right? Poor family eating habits, right? What does your family eat? You know, chances are there's a bunch of junk food in your diet, okay? The American diet is extremely unhealthy. You know what American food is? Hot dogs, hamburgers, right? All that stuff. And we've incorporated stuff from other cultures as well, but it's mostly unhealthy stuff, okay? You eat a lot of packaged stuff, right? Those hot dogs, those hamburgers, right? Uh, that fried chicken. <clears throat> Um, you know, even if you eat pizza, right, that's Italian, but, you know, it's incorporated into the American diet, very unhealthy, very fattening, okay, or even Mexican food, right, those quesadillas and chiladas, all that stuff is really bad, all of it, it's just, you know, it's, it's very bad food. Um, healthy food is actually uh, hard to come by. When you go to the supermarket, most of the stuff you see is unhealthy. All that packaged food is mostly unhealthy. There's only a small section of the supermarket that actually has healthy food. And by the way, that is the food that is not packaged, right? You know, those fruits and vegetables, that stuff, if it is packaged, it has, it's, a, it's what we call single ingredient food. 
you know, maybe like a bag of rice, a bag of beans, a, you know, a, a, a box of oatmeal. And I'm talking about the old fashioned kind, not that stuff that is sweet and comes in little pouches, right? Most of the stuff you see is unhealthy. And that is what we're eating. Those waffles are not healthy. Those pancakes are not healthy. All that stuff is unhealthy, but that's what we're eating. And that's what we're feeding our kids and a lot of junk food, right? Uh, soda, we're drinking less of. It's been, we know how bad soda is now. So we've been drinking less of it, um, you know, uh, oh, yeah, a little bit less. What's happened though is we've replaced that with juice now. We think juice is healthy. Juice is not healthy. Juice, again, just like soda, is sugar water, right? It's, a, it's, it's water with a bunch of sugar in it and some flavoring. That's what juice is. It's not healthy. It's not good for you, okay? But soda is even worse because soda doesn't just have a bunch of sugar. Um, it also basically rots your teeth because it's basically it has acid in it, you know? Uh, I mean, it's basically carbonated. Um, so we don't actually know what we're eating. We don't know that it's, it's okay? There's other social influences. Um, school lunches, uh, for the most part, uh, you know, I, they, there's been some, um, there's some effort to kind of change this, but for the most part throughout, uh, <clears throat> throughout the years, school lunches have been pretty unhealthy. I remember when I was a kid, what we got at school was junk food. You know, we'd get a burrito, we'd get a slice of pizza, uh, kind of what we called a coffee cake, which was basically some sweet bread. You know, uh, we'd get, uh, you know, tacos sometimes, um, hamburgers, hot dog, corn dogs, right? It was all junk food. That's what we got for school lunches. I don't know if you guys are still getting that or if there's an attempt to make it healthier now, right? Where instead of getting, let's say, uh, instead of getting, let's say, uh, you know, that um, an ice cream or something like that, or, you know, you get a fruit or something like that, where you replace some of the, some of the snacks with like healthy stuff, right? Uh, snack machines, right? I think they've, they've been trying to get rid of those and they've gotten rid of those in some schools. Uh, but the snack machines, right? Where you can buy yourself a bag of chips, right? Get yourself a soda, right? Uh, at an inflated price, by the way, because of course it's convenient, it's in school, right? I remember when that started. That started when I was in school, when I was like uh, in, uh, in junior high and, and high school, they started putting these snack machines there. It's just an opportunity for companies, right? To sell you more soda, more snacks. And kids, of course, love this stuff and they would spend their money on that stuff at an inflated price, right? Back then, paying a dollar for a soda was considered a lot when you can get it for less than 50 cents at the store, but you, you pay a premium, right? Because you're, get, you're getting it from a machine at your school. Um, and I remember that stuff and uh, it's just contributing to obesity, right? More sugar, uh, more of these unhealthy snacks, right? Those potato chips, those Doritos, right? All that stuff, right? Uh, instead of getting fresh veggies, right? Um, but also sub subsidies for corn oil, not fresh veggies, right? Uh, believe it or not, a lot of those school lunches are subsidized, which means that the government pays for them. And businesses and companies fight for those subsidies, and they want to make sure that they can continue to get that government money to provide those school lunches. They want to continue to provide those corn dogs and hot dogs. And they fought over this so much that they even, uh, I heard uh, from somewhere, uh, that they actually made it so that they consider ketchup to be a vegetable, which is ridiculous. Ketchup is basically some gooey, goopy, sugar-filled, uh, you know, slime, basically, is what that is, okay? Food advertising. Notice the food advertising. Your billboards, right? Your commercials. All junk food is what they're advertising for you, right? You want to learn more about the whole uh, history of this, um, the stuff about, uh, you know, subsidies for, um, you know, uh, for, uh, for school lunches or for food production uh, and and about why we have this problem, you can watch Fed Up on Netflix, a documentary that talks about uh, these social influences and what's happening to our culture and what's happening to our society, what's happening in the last several decades. It wasn't always that way, by the way, okay? Before I grew up, previous generations, they, um, they ate healthier. They ate less packaged food, less snacks. But things have changed. And we are now a uh, culture of convenience that's just eating stuff that's easy to prepare, stuff that just, you know, that's supposed to be tasty and, uh, and also addicting, by the way, we eat stuff with a lot of sugar, a lot of fat, a lot of salt, and uh, we don't know what we're doing to ourselves. We think we're eating healthy, and even when we try to eat healthy, we don't, most of us don't know what we're doing, okay? But so it's actually necessary that maybe you take a nutrition class or something like that, so you find out what healthy actually is, because we're confused about a lot of things, okay? Um, <clears throat> 
So um, more about obesity. Obesity contributes to slower growth rates, right? Uh, actually, another reason we have obesity is because uh, children are not growing as fast. That's what that refers to, right? So they don't need as many calories. And if they're eating all that junk food, they're getting too many calories and they're gonna gain a bit overweight and become obese. I have a problem with my, you know, with, with my own uh, daughter, right? And I fight with my wife about this stuff, about the fact that, you know, the kids are getting this junk food that, oh, kids need their cookies and they need their, you know, to eat their, their, their chips and things like that. And it's, and I tell my wife, why, why do you encourage that kind of stuff, right? You know, wouldn't you buy the, you know, get, let's give them some bananas, give them some fruit. And I always, I ask for that stuff. I want this stuff, right? And I will actually, you know, cut up a banana and, uh, you know, and, uh, an apple into slices and get food like that. And when I eat it, they see it and they want to eat it too. That's what they should be eating for a snack. Not a bag of Doritos, right? Not, uh, <clears throat> not gummies, right? There's some people actually consider gummies to be fruit. Ridiculous, okay? It's just sugar, right? But all those things, right? They don't need as many calories and they shouldn't be eating round the clock, by the way. They shouldn't be having all these snacks. Obese preteens, right? Those that are, you know, like in this area, right? If they're obese, they have a 64% chance of becoming an obese adult. So basically almost a two out of three chance that they're going to be an obese adult. And if they're an obese adult, they're going to have more health problems. Okay. In general, obesity is a very bad thing. Okay. If you're an adult and you are obese, your health is going to suffer. And when you get to be middle-aged, 40s and 50s, you're more likely to die young. Okay, that's the reality of obesity. Okay, um, how do we avoid obesity? Okay, limit television viewing and snacking, okay? Uh, let, tell kids to go play outside, let them run around, right? Play in the swings, run around, play sports or whatever it is, rather than sitting on their butts watching TV or playing video games. That's a big problem with our culture nowadays, right? Too much TV, too many video games, too much, uh, you know, just being online, okay? And, so, and limit snacking as well, okay? All those potato chips, all that stuff. Let your kids get hungry. Let them play and let them get hungry. Let them be ready for the next meal. I have a problem there also with my wife where we fight about this a lot, where basically it's like the kids are eating every two hours. Every two hours, they're getting something to eat. And when, of course, between meals, what do they get? Snacks, you know, cookies and chips and gummies and junk like that. And I've, we've had so many arguments that they, what are you doing to the kids? Why are you giving them this stuff? They're not even asking you for food. They're not saying they're hungry. Let them get hungry. Let them be ready for the next meal. But of course, when dinner time comes, you know, they're not even that hungry. And a lot of the food is wasted because they've been snacking all day long. And you need to encourage physical activity year round, encourage them to play, run around, right? Year round, even when it's cold. If it's cold outside, guess what? You go outside and play, the body warms up. Okay, we don't live in a state that gets that cold unless you're high up in the mountains, you know, and it snows and stuff like that. But even then, you can play, you can play in the snow, and your, your body warms up after all. You can even start sweating. I've done it. Okay, provide lots of fruits and vegetables, right? Give them fruits and vegetables, right? Fruit tastes really good. Give them that an apple, a banana, rather than that bag of chips, rather than those cookies, right? More vegetables, right? Less of that junk food. Vegetables I know don't taste as good, but you can make them tasty, okay? There are ways to prepare those so they are tasty. You know, by grilling them, incorporating them into the meal, they, they actually taste good to prepare the right way. But fruit is, oh, fruit tastes good by itself. It's sweet. That kind of sugar in fruit is actually okay, by the way, because the fruit provides, um, how do you call it? It provides fiber and you also, you, it does have sugar, but you digest it more slowly, right? Um, because you're not getting a bunch of sugar all at once like you do with a soft drink, okay? Bunch of concentrated sugar all at once, all right? Watch fat intake, right? It's a concentrated source of calories. Don't be going out to eat that much. You'll save money, by the way. But you shouldn't be eating at McDonald's that often or Burger King or going to Pizza Hut or whatever it is, right? Um, <clears throat> even uh, eating out a couple of times a week is too much. In my family, we do it once a week. And when we do, that's an unhealthy meal for me, right? Uh, it's an unhealthy meal for me. It's an unhealthy meal for the kids and my wife as well. But, you know, the kids uh, uh, and, and the wife get unhealthy stuff the whole, the whole week, right? I don't even eat what they eat, to tell you the truth, because I watch myself a bit more. And uh, I don't agree with what they eat. So I follow my own diet. I, I have other needs, okay, that, that they don't have, okay? Um, other recommendations, 
uh, avoid sugar, avoid especially added sugar. And uh, by the way, there's, they, they tried to pass le legislation on this uh, to get companies to label how much sugar they actually add to their products because they add sugar to everything. They add it to bread. It's in, it's in your pasta sauce, right? It's in, uh, it's in everything, even things you wouldn't, you wouldn't think about. But, and you'll, you'll see some containers now in, here in California, right, where it says added sugar, means how much sugar they added. Many times it doesn't say that, it just says how much total sugar it has. But sugar is, is bad for you, okay? Uh, sugar from fruit, like I said, it's okay because it contains fiber, you digest it more slowly, absorb it more slowly. But when you have those sugary drinks, that soda, right, you're getting a lot of sugar all at once with no fiber. Your body absorbs that really quickly. And your liver, because it's getting too much sugar all at once, actually turns a lot of it into fat. I would encourage you to drink more water. Don't drink juice. That's awful, actually. The bottling companies have convinced us that drinking juice is healthy. It is not that much better than drinking a soda. It's awful. Okay? If you want to give them juice, go ahead. Give them some juice. Just not that often. And if I were you, I would water it down. Add some water to it. Because that juice has way too much sugar than it, than it should have. Add a little bit of water. They won't even notice because it's so sweet, right? I used to do that with my, with my kids when they were uh, younger. I'd make it like half juice and half water, right? They wouldn't even notice. Now my wife doesn't even let me do that. They just get the juice just like that, right? Because she's taking control of their diet and stuff like that. And, you know, well, I can't be as influential, I guess. But, uh, yeah, that stuff is bad. Other, you know, other sugary drinks, uh, snacks and stuff like that, um, just because it says 10% juice or it has real juice doesn't mean it's juice, okay? Just because it says, uh, you know, uh, like, uh, like reduce fat or light or something like that doesn't mean it's good for you. Packaged food for the most part is bad for you. We need to eat the way we used to eat. We need to eat natural food, okay, not packaged food. Sugar is linked to obesity, right? Type two diabetes. Heart disease, cancer, according to the American Heart Association. It's really bad for you. Sugar makes you fat, okay? And then you're likely to have those problems. It makes you obese. And that's a big problem that we have nowadays. We're eating too much sugar. Sugar is in everything we eat. It's hard to avoid it. Avoid packaged food, right? Even stuff that's labeled low fat or so-called healthy food is actually bad. Sometimes they remove the fat and they replace it with sugar to make it taste good. Eat natural single ingredient food, right? Eat an apple, eat a banana. Those are snacks, right? Those are good, healthy snacks, some grapes, right? Um, but when it comes to food, like, uh, you know, you eat walnuts, nuts, stuff like that. That's single ingredient food, rice, you know, beans. There's all kinds of other stuff. Lentils, there, there's a bunch of stuff. Tofu, right? Um, limit meat, by the way. Yeah, you can eat meat. I don't eat any, I'm, you know, I don't even eat that, right? Um, I'm vegetarian, uh, but... Uh, you know, don't eat too much red meat. That is particularly harmful, right? But there's other kinds of meat that is more healthy, like fish, chicken, things like that, just as long as it's not fried, by the way. But there's a lot of things you can do, but you need to try to eat more single ingredient food. And by single ingredient food, we mean food that doesn't have a whole bunch of stuff added to it. The stuff that comes in a box usually has a bunch of stuff added to it. There's few exceptions. Like I said, if you get a box of Quaker oats, right? That's usually just basically oatmeal, nothing added to it. It's kind of healthy. I actually mix it with my cereal to tell you the truth because even our cereal is unhealthy. Even our cereal has sugar in it and salt. For me, the hardest thing I find is trying to avoid salt, right? Salt is everywhere too. Um, moderate to vigorous exercise, at least two and a half hours per week. Let your kids play outside. Let them run around. If your kids are obese or overweight, you should make sure they're running around playing outside at least an hour a day. That's what it takes. You know, this thing about 15 minutes of activity, that, that isn't going to cut it, okay? But it's recommended they get at least two and a half hours of vigorous activity, running around, playing sports, things like that, running, actually running around, right? Doing some, you know, play activity that raises the heart rate, at least two and a half hours a week. If your kid's overweight, obese, I would recommend get, they get an hour a day doing that stuff, okay? And it's very easy to do, by the way. Kids love to play, Okay. Um, other health problems that could occur during, that are, can be problematic during middle childhood. Uh, asthma is one of those things. Thankfully, asthma is becoming less common, um, but it has, uh, it used to be a big problem and we need to talk about it. It is a problem in some kids, right? 
Uh, asthma, asthma is a chronic inflammatory uh, disorder of the airways that makes it difficult to breathe. So your airways, for which you breathe, right, they become inflamed, red and inflamed, right, and swollen, and it makes it hard to breathe. Signs include wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, coughing. Basically, you feel like you can't breathe. I don't have asthma. You know, I don't really know what it feels like, um, but I know when I'm really tired and I've been like running around a lot, like I've gone on a jog and, you know, I, I'm trying to catch my breath. I know what that feels like, right? These kids feel kind of like that without them even doing any exercise. They just, they start, when they get an asthma attack, they find it difficult to breathe. Um, what's causing it? Some experts suggest a hygiene hypothesis uh, for current increases in allergies that we, we're seeing more allergies in kids. And some experts say that we're seeing these allergies because children are overprotected from viruses and bacteria, right? Um, that we're cleaning all these surfaces with all this antibacterial stuff and all this stuff and that um, we're overprotecting our kids and our kids are not developing the natural immunity that they should to these things. But asthma itself is, uh, you know, is related to, to other things, okay? But that's in general what some, some experts suggest about, uh, about the increase in allergies, that we're protecting our kids too much, okay? But with asthma, it's a little bit um, different. But here's some more information for you guys. Um, of all uh, US children younger than 18, 14% have been diagnosed, uh, have, have been diagnosed at least once with asthma. So there's actually a lot of kids that actually suffer from this. And you can see it varies, right? The US average, you can see how, the way it is for Asians, African Americans more likely to have asthma, right? So are Native Americans, European Americans. Okay, so that's like the, that's like the average European Americans, that's white people basically. Latinos higher than average, right? Puerto Ricans and African Americans are more likely to have asthma. Why? Where do you think they live? Big cities for the most part, more crowded areas, more poor communities where there's more pollution, more smog, and all that contributes to asthma. Does the answer have to do with nature or nurture, genetics or pollution, right? Well, let's look at the next slide so we can see. Uh, well, actually, the next couple of slides. There's uh, more information on asthma. But um, what, what happens with, um, with asthma? What, is, what, what does it cause, okay? Half of the kids uh, are repeatedly absent from school. Those that have asthma, half of them, right, are absent from school a lot. Uh, there are genetic contributions. Chromosomes 2, 11, 12, 13 have been shown to be related in some way to asthma. So it's probably both genetic and the environment. But pollution, right? Uh, carpets, you know, there's chemicals in carpets. Uh, pets and pet dander and, you know, stuff that att attaches to, you know, to the pet's fur and stuff like that. Less ventilation, less outdoor play, crowding, urbanization, air pollution, right? All trigger asthma. In general, it has to do with stuff in the air that the children are breathing that they should not be breathing, especially pollution. The rate tripled, the asthma, the rate tripled for asthma in, the, in 20 years. It tripled, right? Think about that. Why did that happen? Because cities have gotten bigger, more factories, more pollution, right? That's why it tripled. And I, I'm leaving this for you, even though it's outdated, but it said that it, it was expected to double again by 2020. Well, it did it. It didn't. It didn't happen. You know why? Because our air is actually getting cleaner now because we have renewable energy and there's a push for renewables to use more solar panels and more wind energy rather than just, you know, energy from coal and fossil fuels and things like that, which is causing all the freaking pollution to begin with. Okay. So yes, things have gotten better. Okay. And there's a lot of people who deserve credit for that. And it's not our current administration, by the way, they fight all that stuff, right? If they're in the, in the uh, corner of the fossil fuels, that's what they want to, they want to continue the old way of doing things, right? Rather than pushing for renewable energy, right? Electric cars rather than your gas cars, all that stuff. It's all changing right now very rapidly and our air is getting cleaner, okay? And has been for a while. So this is kind of outdated, but I leave it in there as a reminder to tell you guys about this stuff, right? In LA, right? You used to be able to see a blanket of smog in LA in the 80s. Go look at it now. You don't see that blanket of smog. You don't see that big brown layer anymore. Unless there's wildfires, that's different, right? Um, but you don't see that. There's been a lot of laws passed to clean the air, right? Uh, more regulation, right? Less emissions from cars and that kind of stuff. It's good for the environment. But certain people don't agree with that stuff and want to fight all that stuff because it's bad for business. 
Um, there was a study done on asthma that tells you a lot about asthma and what causes it, okay? There was a study done, right, where they, uh, they tried something, right? They uh, imposed traffic restrictions, right? Where they said, you know, for like 17 days, uh, you know, they uh, basically uh, reduced uh, the number of traffic, right? They encouraged carpooling, they encouraged people basically to, you know, to, um, to drive with each other to work and back, right? So if you have a second person in the car, and everybody does that, that can cut down on half the cars, by the way, to use more mass transit, right? They encourage that, right? Um, they made it free for 17 days. And you know what happens when you make something free? People use it. Make buses free, make that light rail free, right? Um, and people will pack those things to, the, to capacity. And I've seen that because I know when the, when the, when the metro line, the, it was the blue line, the gold line stuff over in LA when they started that, um, I remember I was just starting, uh, I was in graduate school during that time. Um, they made it free when they first started, right? Just to basically market it and, and encourage the use of it. And we packed those things, right? When it was free, because hey, it's free, right? Save money on gas, right? And stuff like that. So they did things like that to really cut down on people driving and therefore cut down on the smog and the pollution that's being emitted. The results are dramatic, okay? There was a drop in the incidence of acute asthma, right? Uh, Medicare asthma treatments went down 42%. HMO asthma treatments went down 44%. So in other words, a lot less people having those asthma attacks and having problems with asthma, right? Almost cut in half. Air pollution makes asthma worse. If we're getting rid of all the air pollution, there'd be, probably be very few people with asthma. Okay, that's how bad air pollution is. Air pollution is actually killing us. And there's movements now, of course, to improve all that and to change all that. But of course, some people are fighting it. They wanna continue the old ways, right? And even uh, a lot of us, a lot of you are still resistant to it, right? Because um, you know, we still drive the kind of cars that pollute. Electric cars are very expensive still. They will be cheaper in the future. They are getting better. And it's predicted by, by 2025. Um, by 2025, if you drive a gas car, uh, it's because you're against this stuff, okay? Because electric cars by then will be just as cheap and better than your regular gas cars, right? But it's only a small percentage of people that are buying them right now because they're still expensive. I even find it difficult to actually, you know, purchase one because they are expensive. It's like buying two cars rather than one, but that will change. In the next five years, you'll be able to buy a, uh, you know, an electric car, a good one uh, for like 25,000, okay? And, may, and uh, maybe even less. And they also save you money on gas, so it comes out even cheaper. Um, Couple of things, uh, let's see how we're doing on time. Couple of more things to talk about, and then we'll call it a day. Um, brain development, after all, we are talking about biosocial development. Um, so this is a, you know, usually a healthy time, right? For children, for the most part, six to 11 years of age. We did talk about some problems like obesity and asthma and things like that, but most children are healthy. Most children don't have those problems, okay? Um, but in order to be healthy, you also need a healthy, well-functioning brain and body, right? A healthy, well-functioning body will affect, you know, human thought. That's called embedded cognition, okay? Experience will affect maturation, and maturation affects experience, okay? So the things you do, the things you're exposed to will affect the development of the body and the brain. And of course, the brain and body also affect the things that you're capable of doing. So the influence goes both ways. It will actually improve your thought, okay? Uh, there's neurological advances that happen during this time, right? Uh, selective attention improves. Children are better able to pay attention for longer periods of time, right? Not like small children that are easily distracted, right? They're able to focus on one thing while ignoring others, right? Focus, let's say, on the lecture or the teacher rather than focusing on the whispering happening, uh, you know, beside them from other kids, right? So they're better able to pay attention and choose what to pay attention to and ignore those things that are distracting. Reaction time shortens. Okay, they're better able to catch a ball, kick a ball, right, uh, play sports because of improved reaction time, right? All these things, these sports, kickball, soccer, baseball, you know, basketball, require uh, improved reaction time and selective attention. They have to pay attention to the right thing, right? You know, in order to be uh, good at the sports, reaction time has to do with the ability that, you know, for you to react. Somebody throws you a ball, right? The ball's traveling through the air quickly, right? You have, a, you know, like a second or so, uh, depending on how far away you are, 
for you to react and put your hands in the right place to catch that ball. Or maybe run to the right location to catch it. That's reaction time, okay? It shortens during this time. Children get a lot better at sports. And it's because of the, uh, of course, the advances that they have in the brain. And of course, the, the body is also improving for the most part, getting bigger and stronger and longer and taller and all that stuff. But of course, some kids are obese and have health problems. Uh, let's talk specifically about the brain. Um, and I feel like we've said some of these things already, okay? Because these things come up again and again. So sensory, you know, and motor uh, functions, complex language, memory, all that stuff continues to improve. Remember, sensory stuff has to do with the senses, right? Your ability to hear and see and all that stuff. Uh, motor functions, movement improves, right? Complex language, language improves. We talked a lot about language already. Memory improves, right? All that continues to improve. And this is all because connections among neurons that are happening uh, as you have experiences, right? As you run and play and you go to school and you learn, right? The brain is still developing. Connections are being formed. Pathways are being strengthened in the brain. And the brain is just getting better at thinking and analyzing and just uh, responding and, you know, and being able to just uh, deal with the world, right? The prefrontal cortex, which is the very front part of the brain that you see there in that little image, the part in dark blue there, uh, develops further. And that allows children to have more control over their emotions, right? More self-control and general control of their behavior as well. The ability to focus, to be more self-aware, right? That's all because of the front part of the brain. Those are the functions of the front part of the brain. The prefrontal cortex, right? Prefrontal cortex is actually not fully developed until uh, you're about 19, 20, 21, according to some research. It continues to develop. And as it develops more, right, you are better able to stop and think and plan better and control yourself better and just behave better, right, rather than just being impulsive. Selection, selective attention improves, right? Children can better attend to one thing, like the teacher, and ignore other things. Children whispering, right? Automization improves. That's important, right? Automization. Automization is the process where thoughts and actions that are repeated in a sequence become automatic. And, and therefore require little conscious thought. I'll give you an example, right? <clears throat> uh, reading at first requires a lot of attention, a lot of thought. It's hard for you as a kid, right? At the beginning, you're learning how to read. You're sounding out all the words, putting those together to, you know, uh, and then trying to read a sentence, right? And uh, as you get better and better, um, basically your ability to read those words becomes automatic and you can read faster and you can read paragraphs, right? And you can read things without even trying that hard. Writing is even harder, right? It takes a lot of thought at first, a lot of attention. And if you do it more and more, it gets easier and can even become automatic. But of course, people vary in their skills, okay? But anything that you do over and over again, you know, can become automatic, just like driving. It was hard at first when you were just first learning and you you were very scared and concerned that you weren't gonna do it right, you're gonna crash and you're thinking about where you put your hands and your feet and the shifter and all that stuff. And now, right, you hardly think about it. You get in your car and you just drive. Language becomes that way, right? Writing can become that way, math can become that way if you keep practicing and you keep repeating those things, right? So you need to encourage children, of course, to go to school and do their work and all that stuff, right? Even sports, right? The more they play, the easier it gets, the better they get at it. Uh, the next part is about uh, the mind, measuring the mind. Basically, uh, it's about intelligence and achievement and things like that and, uh, and related things. But we'll talk about that uh, next time, okay? Uh, because that takes us in a different direction. All right, um, so that is where we will stop. Let me stop recording.